Uh, so next up, we have Pagoda's Jacob Lindahl that's going to talk to us about uh, exploring elegant prototyping with near SDK contract tools. So let's give a round of applause for Jacob, everybody. Hey, everybody. How's it going? My name is Jacob, and we're going to be talking about elegant smart contracts. Going to get into a little bit of smart contract security, talk about a little bit of coding, uh, and then we have a product announcement, or maybe two, at the end. All right, so writing smart contracts is hard. You know, uh, we've been in the, this is the Hacker HQ. I'm sure we've all had uh, a taste of coding in our lives. And writing smart contracts is hard, because in order for a smart contract to be ready for production, it needs to be two things. It needs to be correct, and it needs to be secure. What does that mean? Correct? Well, it's pretty simple. It just means it does the thing. It does the thing correctly. It does the right thing. It works, right? That's what correct means. Well, that's how I'm going to use it in this presentation. And it also needs to be secure. Basically, that means our smart contract doesn't do the wrong things. So we want our smart contract to do the right thing and to not do the wrong things. Unfortunately, this is not, it's not really a balanced issue here. Because if we have a smart contract that is incorrect but highly secure, we basically have a rock. And a rock is not very useful, but I guess it's secure, <laughs> right? Uh, but if we have a smart contract that is correct but insecure, you can actually build an app around that because it's functional. It works. You can build an app around that. You can build an ecosystem around that. People will see, oh, this application works and I might deposit money in it. I can, maybe it's a DeFi contract or a market maker or something, and I can deposit money into this smart contract, and it works. Unfortunately, if it's insecure, you end up with charts that look like this. This is uh, from Chainalysis. It's a graph of the total value that's been lost through crypto-related hacks over the past seven years, and we're not trending in the right direction. Last year, according to this particular analysis, uh, around $3.8 billion worth of value were lost in cryptocurrency-related hacks. And uh, that's not good. <laughs> so what could a potential solution to this problem look like? Well, one of the first things that might jump into your head is auditing. And that's a good thing. Auditing is great but auditing should not be the only security measure that you have in your, development, uh, in your development process. It's really great as a last step. It's that final third party check saying, yes, I'm signing off on this, this looks secure. But it shouldn't be the first step in your security process and it definitely shouldn't be the only step. Let's try and get into a security mindset here and have a little quiz. So we're going to do a little bit of audience interaction here. Um, I have two different code snippets that we're going to look at. They are derived from uh, either real life smart contracts that have been exploited or from audit reports that I have read. So these are, uh, they're not exactly real life snippets because they've been simplified down and they fit on a slide now. Uh, but these are actual real life vulnerabilities that existed at some point in the wild. So this is the first one. Imagine we have a smart contract that allows users to deposit the native token of our network, in this case near, to our smart contract. And then this function, the idea is it allows you to withdraw the number of tokens that you have deposited. So let's read through this line by line. First, we're going to grab the caller of the function, uh, call it sender ID. Then we're going to remove the entry from our balance record because we're withdrawing all of our near, all of our near tokens from the smart contract. And then we'll send the number of near tokens that we have in our balance record, in our balance sheet, to the caller of the function. Does anyone see what might be wrong with this particular function here? Raise a hand, call it out. David, in the back. <laughs> Yes, that is exactly right. We are deleting the record uh, in our balance table before we then try and read that record. And so, of course, this code never works properly because every single time we run this function, the balance record will not exist because we already deleted it. All right, uh, that was the first one. 
pretty easy. Here's our second one. It's a little bit longer, and it's fairly similar in intent to the, to the first code snippet, except in this one, instead of the user depositing native near tokens, we're depositing fungible tokens that implement the NEP141 contract standard. The idea here is, okay, maybe the user doesn't want to withdraw all of their tokens, they just want to withdraw some of them. That is intended, that's not a bug in this particular piece of code. Uh, they might want to just leave some of the tokens in the smart contract. So let's step through this line by line. Again, we get the caller, then we loop through all of the tokens we want to withdraw. We make sure that the balance record in our balance table uh, says that the caller of the function has enough tokens that they say they want to withdraw. Then we send them that number of tokens, and then finally we remove the record from the balance sheet. Does anyone see what might be wrong with this piece of code? Sorry, they're bringing you a mic. <laughs> uh, it could be uh, repeatedly to withdraw those uh, amount of money, right? You say a little louder? Uh, repeatedly to, to withdraw those money. Repeatedly withdraw? Yeah. Yep, that's exactly correct. If, if I specify that I want to withdraw, uh, say, say I have legitimately deposited 10 USDC or something into this contract, and I say, I want to withdraw my 10 USDC, but I specify USDC 30 times in my list of tokens here, I will be able to withdraw way more tokens than I am entitled to withdraw. All right, so hopefully that whet your appetite, got you into kind of this security mindset, and let's talk about some principles for smart contract design. Uh, and these are kind of principles for secure smart contract design. So we have four of them here, we'll go through them one at a time. Uh, yeah, there we go. First one is trustless. We talk a lot about trustlessness. I'm going to split this word in two. We'll say trustless. And the idea here is we have a lot of different entities that are talking to our smart contract, and we really don't want to trust them too much. Uh, I'm going to call out two specific areas that I see a lot of excessive trust uh, in different smart contracts that I've read, particularly in audit reports. Um, the first is don't trust user input. As we saw in that second example, that second code snippet, it's possible that unintentionally or maybe even maliciously, a user could provide a payload that causes our smart contract to work improperly. So make sure to validate that user input. The second thing is don't trust other smart contracts. In particular, this might crop up when you're interacting with, say, a token, uh, like a fungible token smart contract and you just assume, oh, this implements the NEP141 standard, this implements the NEP171 standard, and you just assume that it works properly. And a lot of times, that'll work just fine. It'll probably work just fine in your testing, but when you're out in the wild, there might be a smart contract that claims to implement NEP141 correctly, but doesn't. Maybe it was an accidental bug, or they just slightly modified the contract, but still try to work with applications that support NEP 141, or maybe it's an actively malicious smart contract that claims to implement this standard, but doesn't actually. So the, those malicious smart contracts could potentially uh, take advantage of that assumption, and that's a recipe for disaster. Our second, uh, our second item here is to make the invalid impossible. I'm trying to make these like really short and pithy statements. Uh, if you do a Google search for make invalid states unrepresentable, that'll bring up a whole bunch of articles about this very topic. But I chose this particular illustration because if you think of the data structures and the way that your smart contract handles data as like a mold, and then your data that you receive as input from other smart contracts, from your users, so on and so forth, as uh, something you're pouring into that mold, you want to design that mold in such a way that no matter what data comes in, if, if you can get it to fit into that mold, it's going to be valid data, right? You just want to be able to have this contract about the data that your smart contract is dealing with, where you know if it fits in this data type, if it fits in this struct I've designed, this enum I've designed, so on and so forth, then it will be valid data. And as much as possible, we want to operate with these really strong guarantees about our data. So make invalid states unrepresentable. Design your data structures in a way to avoid supporting invalid contents. Next, we have one truth. Have one source of truth for the data in your smart contract. 
If you have multiple different places where you're storing the same data, that can cause some synchronicity issues. And I chose this uh, illustration of a funnel here to kind of uh, illustrate the idea that if you have one source of truth for your data, you can also really tightly control how that data changes, right? There's only one way to access this data, and in order to access it, you have to go through all of these different checks, all of these different verifications, and those are always going to be in sync with each other because, well, there's only one thing to be in sync with. Finally, test for failure as well. Of course, we want our smart contracts to be correct. We want the happy path to work, and that's a really easy thing to test. What's not always as intuitive to test is failure. We want to make sure that, yes, our smart contract works where it's supposed to work, but we also want to make sure that it fails where it's supposed to fail. So, test for failure too. Finally, uh, doing all of that is hard. And it is, it's really hard. It is hard. It is hard. Um, so, luckily we have a bunch of tools at our disposal to help with this. I'm going to particularly call out the programming language Rust. Huge fan, anyone who knows me, I really like programming in Rust, and luckily, Near Protocol is built in Rust and supports it as a first-class citizen for smart contract programming. So we have this really strong type system that comes with Rust, algebraic data types, fancy enums, fancy structs, and it makes it so that, oh, it's a little bit harder at, uh, at first, a little steeper, uh, steeper learning curve to get started with Rust, but once you get used to it, the Rust compiler actually becomes like a friend. It's helping you to code correctly. The second thing we have in Rust is powerful macros. If you're someone who might be coming from a little higher level programming background, something like JavaScript or Python, the idea of metaprogramming or macros might be new to you. A macro is basically just code that writes code. So metaprogramming because we're programming the programming language. This is an example of a macro invocation in Rust. Derive debug there, uh, kind of highlighted in that bluish green color and it expands to this big long thing and you'll see here it's it's actually taking into account the item that annotate that it was attached to that message struct so it prints out all the fields and it prints out the name of the struct so on and so forth so this is the idea of meta programming my team has taken all these ideas these security concepts and the powerful tools that rust avails to us and designed a new smart contract library called Near SDK Contract Tools that provides a bunch of one-liners implementing a bunch of different contract standards and not just the NEP standards but other tools as well so you can implement online multi-sig wallets, you can implement ownership, you can implement uh, role-based access control, uh, contract pausability, there's even a uh, more optimized account ID uh, utility in there as well, and a whole bunch of other stuff that hopefully you will find useful. The one-liners work just like this, so this is kind of your boilerplate that you'll see very often in a near protocol uh, smart contract that's built in Rust. In order to implement, say, a fungible token, then all you have to do is, well, import it from the library and then add one single line and you automatically implement three different contract standards. Luckily, the way this library is designed is you can choose the amount of magic that you want in your smart contract. So here, there's a lot of magic going on. Uh, you just have the one line, and it does a ton of stuff. But this smart contract library has layers of magic that you can decide to implement all of the different standards manually and connect them together by yourself or use a little bit of magic here and less magic elsewhere. It's very flexible, modular. It doesn't tie you into uh, just this ecosystem. It plays very nicely with the other smart contract libraries that are available for near protocol. And of course, if you want to extend the functionality of this library, there are hooks that make it really easy to say, make your fungible token pausable. And again, this is a, a high level of magic that you're seeing right here, but uh, you can kind of choose the amount of magic that you want in your smart contract. This is just the highest level for the most concise code. All right, so that was magic, but I hear you, you're sitting there, you're saying, I don't wanna have to learn a whole new smart contract library in order to uh, you know, leverage these uh, primitives that are available in this smart contract library. I just want to get started, get off the ground running quickly. So, 
my team has also designed another tool that is available on the boss. It is called the Contract Wizard. You can scan the QR code right there to access it or go to near.org and search for Contract Wizard. It'll pull up this user interface and you can right away just generate the code to get you started uh, writing a smart contract that implements all of these different standards and takes advantage of the power of the Rust programming language and also this smart contract library was designed with all these security considerations in mind as we were writing the library. So that is all I have for you today. That's the same QR code that was on the previous slide. So scan it and start writing your smart contracts on Near in Rust. Thank you very much. All right, it looks like we have a little bit of time for questions, so I would love to take questions from the audience if you have uh, anything that you would like me to uh, detail a little more. Yes. Sorry, they're, they're bringing you a mic. <laughs> uh, will it uh, enlarge my WASM file? Because I, my WASM file is really big now. <laughs> Your WASM file is really large? Yeah, really large. So you want to optimize it? Yeah, so if I use your, your tools, it, it will be a larger? Oh, it will not be larger because this uh, smart contract uh, library is composed mostly of macros. You will only oh. generate extra code when you actually invoke the macros. So just by including the library, your smart contract won't be any bigger. OK, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Any other questions? What, what's the next step? What's the next step for near SDK contract tools? Well, um, one of the things that we're really excited about for, oh, does this back button work? I don't think, oh, there it goes. Now, now it just went really far back. Okay, so um, some of the things that we are working on for near SDK contract tools is, well, more standards like the multi-token multi standard that's uh, next up, as well as uh, for the contract wizard. We have some really high hopes for this because this is really, really just the start of uh, the contract wizard with the relayers and the um, other fun stuff that has been announced at NearCon. We are hoping to make it so that you can not only generate the code, but also generate the WASM blob and even deploy the smart contract that you generated directly from the boss. So those are some things that we are looking forward to in the future. We have another question over here. Hi. Will you do the same thing for the soulbound token? Because it was pretty uh, successful with the NDC election. And yeah, I, I think reputation will be something on near. And uh, yeah, I would be very glad to see that for soulbound token. A soulbound token, so like the idea of an NFT that's non-transferable? Correct. Right, so um, we have the non-fungible token standards, NEP171, and we have the macros that implement that all for you. And if you recall here, we have different hooks here. Now, you don't, you're not restricted to using just, say, the pausable hook. You can also write your own hook for different uh, life cycle methods of the different standards. So, for example, there exists a transfer hook for NEP171. And you can implement something in there that will make it impossible, you know, uh, say error out, panic every time a transfer is attempted. So you could make a token that implements the NEP171 standard but disables transfers quite easily. Mm -hmm. Are there any plans to add uh, async Rust when calling other contracts <laughs> inside of the uh, contract library? So, <laughs> uh, there is, I've been discussing uh, some very primitive plans uh, with some of my coworkers. We've been talking about uh, thinking about adding some async Rust features Maybe in this library, maybe in a different library. Hasn't really been decided yet, uh, but in particular, 
uh, some async Rust features might be coming. Uh, I might have uh, taken a chunk of time directly after <laughs> NearCon in which I'm going to attempt to implement that. Uh, but that's not necessarily a guarantee at this point in time. <laughs> Definitely of interest, though. <laughs> Thank you for the question. All right, and it looks like that is our time right there. So thank you, everybody, for attending. And uh, <laughs> use near SDK contract tools. <laughs>